Hi and welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at Faraday's laws which are applying to electroplating. So using electrolysis to coat something at the cathode with another metal. So let's get having a look. This will involve a number of stoichiometry calculations as well as redox equations. So the idea of electroplating is that we can deposit a layer of metal on the surface of another metal by electrolysis, remembering that anything at the cathode of an electrolytic cell is going to act as though it's inert. So if we are reducing a metal onto something at the cathode, it will be coating whatever the cathode is. This means instead of just using a rod or a standard electrode plate, if we put an object at the cathode, this will now become our negative electrode and reduction is going to occur here. The electrolyte contains the ions of the metal and then the metal will be plated onto the object. So here we can see as always the power supply dictates the polarity of our electrons and in this case we're looking at the plating of a tin. Okay, so often our steel tins are coated with tin, hence why they're called tins. Okay, and we need an electrode of the metal to be um, at the positive electrode. So this is the plating metal, the metal that we want to plate onto um, the object, and then the object is at the cathode. Okay, so we have a plating metal at the anode. The electrolyte needs to contain the ions of the metal that we want to reduce. And then SN2 plus here is going to be reduced to SN solid at the cathode. This is what it looks like in a little bit more detail. Okay, so at the negative electrode, our cathode, the power supply is pushing the electrons along the wire into the electrode. So our electrons are coming in, down along the wire, and we will have reduction occurring at the cathode. So our tin ions in solution will be reduced to tin metal, coating our tin can with the layer of tin that we're after. At the anode, tin will be being oxidized. The electrons will be moving up out of the electrolyte moving along the wire this way and tin will be being oxidized from solid tin into aqueous tin ions at the anode. So as the tin ions are reduced at the cathode they are replaced at the anode by the oxidation of the tin metal. metal. Okay, now the rest of the charges are going to be balanced by the electrolyte solution. And in general, our cations are going to move towards the cathode and anions move towards the anode, carrying the current through the electrolyte. This same process can be used to plate objects with silver. So silver plating, we can coat a cheaper metal such as iron with a silver coating using a silver electrode at the anode and silver nitrate solution, of course, connected to a battery in order to supply the electric current. What we can do is once we understand the plating mechanism is we can actually determine exactly how long the cell needs to be run for to get a specific amount of metal. If we're going to use electroplating in industry, this is exactly what we need to do. We need to be able to quantify the amount of electro of the metal being plated and the time that the object needs to be put in there in order for us to work out a cost and timings for production. This is where Faraday's law comes in and Faraday's law is a way for us to equate the mole back to the electrolytic process. When we look at Faraday's laws, we need to consider a number of different terms. This is, we need to know time. This is given the symbol lowercase t, and we use the unit of seconds. So anytime you are going to see time, you are going to need to convert this into seconds. Remembering that there is 60 seconds in one minute. Okay. And then of course, 60 minutes in one hour remembering that you can convert between these. Current 
Okay, current is a measure of the electrons that pass through the wire in a given time. It is given the symbol capital I, and its unit is amperes or amps. The electric charge is defined as capital Q and is given the unit coulombs, and we have the equation Q is equal to the current multiplied by the time that the cell is running. Then Faraday, which is given in your data booklet, is the num charge on one mole of electrons. So in this case, the units will be coulombs per mole, and one Faraday is equal to 96,500 coulombs per mole. This value is given in your data booklet. So this means that we can work out the amount of charge divided by the amount of charge per one mole, and we will get the number of electrons. So the mole of electrons is going to be equal to Q divided by Faraday's constant, 96,500. Let's have a look at a couple of applications of this in questions. What this is telling us is that the mass of the metal produced at the cathode is proportional to the quantity of the electricity that passes through the cell, and this makes sense. We need to have those electrons in order to reduce the metal, so if we have a smaller number of electrons passing through the cell, we'll have a smaller amount of metal. So we can see here that this is looking at silver, and the mass of silver deposited at the cathode increases as we increase the amount of charge that goes through the cell. However, when we look at this when we compare different metals to each other, we can see that mass and charge for different metals shows that we have this linear relationship, but there is a little relationship between each of the different metals. We can see that the mass certainly is increasing linearly for each metal, but the metals have different masses. Of course, this is because of the different charge and mass of the metals themselves. If we look at silver, in order to deposit one mole of silver from silver ions, which are Ag+, I need Ag+, plus plus one electron to go to Ag solid. That means that the number of mole of electrons that I put through the cell will equal the number of mole of silver that I get. If I put one mole, 96,500 coulombs worth of charge, I will get one mole of silver which will of course have a different mass to the mole of lead or otherwise that I might be looking at for other metals. Two mole, I get two mole of silver and so forth. However, for metals such as copper, tin and lead, if I plot the number of mole of metal that I get with the number of mole of charge, I will only get one mole of metal once I have put in two mole of electrons. And this is because metals such as copper, copper 2 plus, plus two electrons to go to copper solid. Here, the number of mole of copper solid is going to be equal to 1 over 2 the number of mole of electrons. So I will get half the mole of metal for the number of electrons that I put in because I need two electrons for every mole of copper to be reduced. We see the same thing if we go to chromium where we have Cr3 plus plus three electrons will go to chromium solid, which means I will need three mole of electrons for every mole of chromium to be deposited. So now we can use our mole ratios, what I want over what I know, and apply this to our new equations, where Q is going to equal the number of electrons times Faraday, rearranging this to the number of like uh, mole of electrons is going to be equal to Q over F, giving us a new equation for the mole. So these are our two equations for Faraday's laws in order for us to be able to apply them in different questions. So Q is equal to IT, where Q is charge in coulombs, I is the current measured in amps, i.e. what we can get from the ammeter in the lab, time measured in seconds, and of course our number of mole of electrons is equal to the charge divided by Faraday's constants.
which is 96,500 coulombs per mole. Okay, there are our equations. I'm going to stop this here, and in the next video, I will show you the series of calculations that we can use these for.